In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy of Guadalupe, Pray for us. Saint Joseph, Pray for us. Father Terry, Saint Nacio Leola, O God's angels and saints, Pray for us. in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to try to conclude this, uh, this lecture as I'm going to try to go through the, the whole of the liturgical year, and that'll be my intention this, uh, this class. So as we said last week, the church year has a cycle, and there are actually three cycles. There are cycle, cycle A, B, and C. Okay, cycle E, this would be for the Sunday cycle. Okay, during the weekday, you just have odd and even. So what do we have cycle A, B, and C? Cycle A, you're going to have the Gospel of St. Matthew. Then cycle B will be the Gospel of St. Mark with the addition of St. John because St. Mark as I mentioned, is a very short gospel. There are only 16 chapters, whereas St. Matthew got 28, which is almost twice as long, the gospel of St. Uh, Matthew. Then the cycle C is St. Luke, and we entered into the cycle C just a couple weeks ago when we started Advent. Okay, so th those are the three cycles. As mentioned last week, we have the beginning of the church year is not simultaneous with the civic year. Civic year starts on January 1st, whereas the church new year starts with Advent. Starts with Advent. And Advent, uh, Advent, as we said last week, is not always the same number of days. You can have Advent in which you have three weeks in one day. Other times you have almost the, four, the full four weeks. But as mentioned, you always have four candles. And the reason being is because you're, al you're always going to have four Sundays in Advent. Uh, but you could have four Sundays in one day, so you only have 22 days in Advent. It could be as short as that. I think it was that way last year, whereas this year it's, it's, it's longer. So Advent uh, culminates in Christmas, Christmas Eve, which this year will be, uh, will be eight days from today. Then Christmas, there are three Christmas Masses, the Mass of Christmas Eve, then you have the Christmas Mass at dawn, then you have a Christmas Mass in the evening, so a three, or afternoon, or day rather. So you actually have three different readings for, for Christmas. Then when you enter into Christmas season, Christmas season lasts about two and a half weeks. And in Christmas season, you're going to have these uh, feast days. So given that Christmas falls on Saturday, then right after that, the, the Sunday after Christmas, you have the feast day of Holy Family, of jo Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. 
you have that. Then January 1st, we celebrate uh, Mary, the, Mary, the Mother of God. Solemnity, Mary, Mother of God, as well as the Universal Day of Peace, proclaimed by Pope Paul, Paul, Paul VI. Then, um, the following Sunday, uh, we celebrate the feast day of the Epiphany, sometimes called the feast day of the kings. Epiphany of the feast day of the kings. Traditionally, that's been on, on January 6th, but it's usually celebrated uh, the Sunday after the feast day of Holy Family. Then after, after the feast day of Epiphany, we celebrate the baptism of Christ. It was the baptism of Christ. Then we, with that, you enter into a new church um, time. So there you have Advent, Christmas, Christmas season, okay, Christmas season, Holy Family, Mary, the mother of God, the Epiphany, then after the baptism of our Lord, we actually end the Christmas season with the uh, compline of, of the baptism of our Lord, which would be the night prayer we end, and we, we enter into what is called ordinary time. So that's a summary of what we, the class last week, if you weren't here, that's a a succinct summary of what we, what we learned last week. Okay, so from there, you enter into what is called ordinary time. Ordinary time, the priest is no longer going to be wearing white, that we, we wear actually the color for, for Lent, from Lent as well as Advent, we wear purple. The Christmas season, we wear white. Then after the Christmas season, we enter into ordinary time. Now, there are actually two different ordinary times in the church year. One is relatively short. The other one is about six months, which is very long. Okay? So the first is is relatively short and ordinary time we the priest wears the color which is green for ordinary time just that you're aware of this the stole that the priest wears this is called the stole as i said i would i would give a, a class on church vocabulary but because it's important to know to know the language that we use Every, every discipline has a different language. I think yeah, last week I, I was speaking baseball language and no, under, no one understood what I, what I was saying. No? Well, maybe, maybe a couple of men know a little bit about baseball. No? You're turning two, you might know. Suicide squeeze, I really doubt it. A can of corn, that's New York <laughs> for a pop-out. Uh, <laughs> But that's uh, baseball lingo that I was brought up and raised because I played baseball all the way into college, so I know that language, okay? I was reading, I was, years ago I was reading an, an article, an article, and I only stood about 50% of it, and the author was Dr. Michael J. Broom, that happens to be my brother, I understood only half of it because it was the most technical medical language on back surgery, and I don't have vocabulary in, in medical surgery. Even though it was my brother, I know him very well, he was using all these technical words that I'd never heard before. So you have language, you know, language to convey uh, certain concepts, and you have language, also theological language. Uh, what, what is hypostatic union? What is eschatology? What is ecclesiology? Those are terms that explain theological concepts. So also in the liturgy, there are, there are, are words that we use 
For example, epiclesis. You probably never heard that before. That's when the, the priest places his hands over the gifts, invoking the Holy Spirit to come and to change the water and wa- the, 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 the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That's called epiclesis. That's, that's liturgical vocabulary. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's move then into, into ordinary time. So we said there are two ordinary times. There's the short and ordinary time, and then there is the longer ordinary time. I should probably say this now because related to the colors. Even during ordinary time, you're going to see the priest coming out uh, dress sometimes in white and sometimes in, in red, even during ordinary time. Uh, what is the reason behind that? Because during the, t- the ordinary time, the church is celebrating what's called the Santoro. That's a liturgical term for celebrating the saints. So you're going to have you're going to have certain times where you're going to have almost back to back to back, white and red. Back to back to back, white and red. Uh, for example, in, in, in October, we're, we're in the second ordinary time, uh, October, you're going to get almost every day for about eight days, you're going to get a color that's either going to be red or white. October 1st, the little flower, the priest comes out in white. October 2nd, the garden angel, the priest comes out in white. October 4th, St. Francis, the priest comes out in white. October 5th, <laughs> St. Faustina, a new saint, the priest comes out in white. October 6th, St. Bruno, the priest comes out in white. October 7th, <laughs> uh, later the rosary, the priest comes out in white. So even though it's ordinary time, you've got a, you have a week in which almost every day that week you're celebrating a saint that is in the church calendar. Which for me, I love it. I love, I love to celebrate the saints. I love it. One of my greatest joys is, is to get to know the saints, preach the saints, learn about the saints, and at least try to imitate them, at least to my poor limited degree. No? Okay, or, so there you have the ordinary time from the baptism of Jesus. And it's going to be it depends. Sometimes Lent falls later. Sometimes it falls earlier. But ordinary time is usually about eight or nine weeks, the first. About eight or nine weeks. So usually you're going to be starting, entering into Lent in February, second or third week of February. So there you have ordinary time. With ordinary time, we should try to live ordinary time with extraordinary love. Okay, that should be our intention to live ordinary time with extraordinary love. Yes. Well, Christmas Day, we actually we, we actually put a, a fifth candle in. That will be a white candle, and that will be with the celebration of Christ, Christmas. Technically, it would be Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Good question, because there is the white candle that, that's, that's lighted for Christmas. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'd like to, most of my lecture today will be what, I'll be talking about right now. Uh, I'll, I'd like to talk then about the Lenten season. The Lenten season. Okay, the, the, the Advent season and the Easter season, all together you have about maybe seven weeks. Now, the Lenten season and the Easter season is very, very long. Lent is 40 days, but we don't count the Sundays. 
and we don't count, we don't count the Easter Triduum, so practically it's 50 days. Okay, because you have those six Sundays, right? Easter Triduum are three days, so it's 49 to 50 days, and how long is the Easter season? It's 50 days. So you had 100 days there. That's a, that's a lot of days, isn't it? Yeah. And we, 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 we relive this every year. So uh, being aware of the importance of Lent and Easter, just the number of days. Okay. Let's talk then about the Lent and the Lenten season. Okay, Lent and the Lenten season. Okay, Lent starts on Ash Wednesday, but it's not the same day every year. But it starts always with, with Ash Wednesday. Always with Ash Wednesday. Now that Ash Wednesday, the, the whole character of Ash Wednesday, there's a, a, a lot of confusion as to what you're supposed to do, what does it mean, what about the ashes, do you have to fast, do you have to abstain? There's a lot of confusion in that. Okay, technically speaking, it's, you're, not obliged, you're not obliged to receive the ashes. If you don't receive the ashes, it's not a sin. However, you should try to get the ashes. You should try to get the ashes. At least uh, in, in the Mexican culture, we have a lot of Mexicans here, or second generation Mexican, that with Our Lady Guadalupe, that, that's probably the, the day in which most people come to church the whole year, which is Ash Wednesday. And if you are of Mexican origin, you know what I'm talking about, right? Before the pandemic, we would get eight to 9,000 people coming to get their ashes. You'd have lines almost all the way to McDonald's, no? But they couldn't eat the hamburgers because it's a day of fasting. <laughs> Huge numbers from four o'clock until eight o'clock. Every 20 minutes, the church was packed. Yeah, I mean, they want their ashes, no? And m most would think that it would be a sin not to get your ashes because the ashes is kind of like a passport to heaven. You know? Whereas in Argentina, in Argentina, it's the palm. Every culture is different. They, they, the palm Sunday is more important than the ash Sunday. It depends on the culture, no? Now, yeah, to receive the ashes is, is important, but it's not obligatory. Namely, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be a sin if you don't receive the ashes. For, for me, for many, many years, I, I like Ash Wednesday. Uh, primary, for, for me, the primary purpose, I mean, the grace that I saw is we got huge numbers of people. Let's preach. Let's preach. Because we got eight, eight to 9,000 people here, and a lot of these people are people that don't come to church. Give them. For me, every opportunity I have, I catechize. Every opportunity. Every opportunity. The catechize. Uh, and it gave meat and potatoes. None of this high in the sky theological stuff that people never understand. Give them meat and potatoes. That'll help, help them to get to heaven. So uh, Father Larry would always say, you know, don't preach too long because then we won't get the other people in. So the time limit that he would give to me, I would preach, okay, maybe a five minute in English and a five minute in Spanish. These are people that have maybe never heard a homily in 15 years. There are those people that come to church on three occasions when they're hatched, matched, and dispatched.
bautizado, casado, despachado. You throw water, rice, and dirt, three different things. But I thought you'd like that one, huh? But you know, because be, be, because a lot of a, a lot of these people are coming because of their superstition. You don't get the ashes, and something bad is going to happen to you. Uh, but well, you, you people here are, are, are pretty well formed, and these people will come for the ashes, but they could care less about Holy Communion. So you have masses, and more than once we've no, I don't want that, that, that white thing, I want my ashes. No? Oh, yeah. Sad, isn't it? You know, they give me the ashes, but that, that white thing, you know, I, don't, I didn't come for that. And, and once again, I'm saying, for, for me as a priest and teacher, for me, it's a, sor it's a source of, of joy because I can be preaching to these people. Same thing with weddings and baptisms. Weddings and baptism, they're just, they just come, it's like a pageant. Okay? But I've got a captive audience there, I'm going to give them a substantial 15, 20 minute homily. I mean, <laughs> they've got to listen to me. Otherwise I won't give them the final blessing. No? So I'll go into two different languages. These are, for me, they're souls to be saved. But they don't know anything, and often it's really not their fault because their parents never really taught them anything. So I try to try to really take a very merciful interpretation of the reality. However, when women are coming and properly dressed, they got to change because they're scandalizing little kids. In that case, uh, Therese is very strong and cracking down. You got to put the shawl on. You can't be dressed like that. You got little kids here. You got the Blessed Sacrament here. And we, we struggle with that always. You know, even thanks be to God when it gets cold and rainy, but still, even with that, you can't even win a, can't even win them all, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we enter into the threshold of Lent with Ash Wednesday. You, okay, you're not obliged to get the ashes, but you are obliged to fast. Yeah. What's harder, to fast or to get the ashes? <laughs> ashes is a piece of cake, no? Fasting, yeah. And so that's from from eighteen to fifty nine. Just so you're aware that from 18 to 59, you're obliged to fast. Beyond the 59, you're not obliged to. If you can, you've got physical strength and goodwill. Why not? We eat too much anyway in this country, right? But not, not to confuse a fast with a diet. Fast and the diet, ex exteriorly, it might be the same thing. You're eating less. You know, actually, a, a, a diet could actually be sinful if the purpose is so you can maybe seduce a good-looking guy. That's sinful. So a lot depends upon your, your, your intention. A, a desert monk fasting and a Hollywood actress is probably going to be a little bit different, right? Even though they might be Eating, le e eating the same quantity, which is less. Okay, now, God is going to be judging our intentions, too. Okay, the Lenten season and the Advent season are the two key seasons of the year which culminate in the two most important feast days in the year. Advent culminates 
in the birthday of Christ. Lent culminates in Holy Week. Holy Week, and then we have, in Holy Week, you have the heart of Holy Week, which is the Triduum. Okay, the liturgical changes in Lent are the following. Like Advent, the priest wears purple. Okay, there is, okay, there are several things that are actually suppressed. Okay, the, the Alleluia is not sung. as well as the Gloria in the Mass is not prayed or, or sung. It's not an ideal time to be celebrating weddings, however, however, we do have them because what we have often are people that are living together from 10 to 45 years Get them married, and they're, they're converted in, in the time of Lent by getting their marriage blessed in the church. But technically, that's not the ideal time to be, to mar to be married. Easter season, ordinary time, yes. All right, then the Lent, Lent season lasts 40 days, not counting the Sundays, and not counting the Easter Triduum. What about um, our obligation? Okay, in Lent, Advent, technically, you're not, you're not obliged to be practicing a strong, rigorous penance in Advent. Technically, you're not. But it wouldn't be a bad idea. I was brought up and raised, which our family, we, we offered sacrifices in both Advent and Lent. And as a child, I thought that we had to offer sacrifices in Advent, but Technically, you're not obliged, but Lent you are. Lent, we, Lent we, we, we have to practice some type of penance. Now, how can you, how can you choose that? There are, there are many ways, and it's a good idea to talk with a spiritual director to see what, what is the best thing for you to do in Lent to talk it out with the spiritual director to see what's, what's possible. Many people, uh, many people are entering into, I hear it from a lot, in which they're fasting, which is, it's, it's, it's good. However, to fast, you have, you, you have to know how to do it. You have to be trained. And uh, I think it's a good idea to run that by your spiritual director. And I'll tell you what, what often happens, people of goodwill, they're fasting, and then they're fasting the whole day until sundown. Then they sit down, they eat, eat three times as much. You know? <laughs> really. So I, I, I purposely, I, 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 we have to fast, but if that's the case, you're waiting and then you sit down, you're eating three times as much, I think you're defeating the purpose. I think you're defeating the purpose. I've always, people ask me about fasting, I tell them a fasting that they, they've never heard, of, heard about, but St. Ignatius speaks about it. You want to hear it? Yes. Okay, yes. Yes. when you sit down to eat, get up with a little bit of hunger. Every time you sit down and eat. That's the, for me, that's the most difficult. 
I try to do that. I don't, I don't do it that well, but that, it's kind of my doing long fast from not eating for two or three days. I don't think I'm strong enough. No? But sitting down and eating. Do you know in, in, in English the difference between moderation being a, a, abstemious? Have you ever heard that word? Yeah, okay, no, no. Abstemious means you're depriving yourself of what's necessary. Moderation means you're eating sufficient. Now, if you, if you, if you try to do that, not, okay, on Sundays and holidays and other days, okay, have a good meal. On sun, a Sunday, oh, we will talk about this, Sunday we celebrate Easter every, every Sunday. Sunday is a mini, a mini Easter. But getting in, the, getting, in the, getting in the habit of eating less, I think it's the most difficult because it's a style of life. And we have a tendency to eat too much. Okay? We have a tendency to eat too much in this country. I don't, I mean, now and then I'll go out with a couple of friends and have a meal. And the, the, the portions at restaurants are enormous. I could, I could barely eat a half of what they offer to me. No? So, uh, I, I could give a whole talk just on ho what fasting is, how to do it, what's the purpose, what are the intentions, what are the effects of it, but that's not my primary purpose today, but that is part, part of Lent is practicing some type of penance. You could, uh, if, you've, if you've ever been to Mass on, on Ash Wednesday, most of you would probably have, do you remember the Gospel, any of you? What's that? No, that's the first Sunday. Now, Ash Wednesday, you have Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus gives the three different ways of pleasing God. Jesus speaks about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. The first Sunday is always the temptations of Jesus. But the Ash Wednesday gospel, Jesus, it's in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus proposes us three ways that we can arrive at conversion. Deep prayer, penance, and almsgiving. And if, you, if you're attentive to the readings in the Masses during, during Lent, you're going to almost always have one of those three, three themes. I say at least 80%. Oh, okay, that's really the... That, oh, we got the Our Father prayer. Ah, Jesus speaks about... Ah, almost every, every uh, weekday Mass, you'll have one of those three practices. So with proper spiritual direction, you would ask your spiritual director through prayer which of those three areas would be best, or, or maybe a little bit of each. Okay? Or maybe one week you're going to do something, and the following week you're going to do something else. I think we have in our mind that the penance we start off has to be the same penance the whole 40 days, I believe right is the spice of life. I think it's a good idea sometimes to change it. Otherwise, it becomes boring, no? A variety. And the, pur the, the purpose is conversion. Now, when you receive ashes, who on earth knows the meaning of what the ashes are? Now, they just want the ashes, but they don't know the meaning behind it. Now, I don't know if we, we do it. We, we do it so quick. We have to move at a quick pace, otherwise we'll we'll, we'll arrive at Palm Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> but there are two different things that the priest can say. The ashes, by the way, are taken from the palms that are burnt. The palm, the palms from Palm Sunday. Very interesting, isn't it? So the palms on Palm Sunday, they're burnt. They're incinerated. We use those. And it's almost as if God is saying, don't waste things. Everything that I've given you in creation, use, things, use the things properly. Use them properly. Okay, the, 
the, the priest can say one of two things. And they're, they're taken from sacred scripture. First would be, remember that you are dust, and into dust you shall return. Where does that come from? That comes from Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of Adam and Eve. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God meets out a triple chastisement. One chastisement is on the woman, that she'll bring forth children in suffering. The man, that he will earn his bread with the sweat of his brow. And then the serpent will crawl on the ground eating dirt. And then, as a result of original sin, as St. Paul points out in Romans, uh, death entered into the world through sin. Okay. So as a result of sin, death entered into the world. And there we have, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay, what it means is this. The church is teaching us our mortality. The church is teaching us that one day we're going to die. That is a very sober truth. But you've done the exercise with me. We go through the four last things, right? It's a very sober truth that most Americans don't want to hear at the cocktail party. They don't want to hear that, no? Even though every day we hear about tragic deaths, we hear about every day in the news, but we don't, we don't want to apply that to ourselves. But one day we're going to die. So we recognize that one day we're going to die where, when, how, we don't know. But the most important moment in our life, according to St. Catherine of Siena, is the moment we die. That will determine for all eternity our eternal destiny, which means either salvation or, or, or condemnation. So that's taken from Genesis chapter, chapter 3. Another Another possibility is the priest can say, repent and believe in the gospel. So he can say one of the two. I will use, <laughs> I say that because it's shorter. The other one is twice as long. And I've got a long line of 120 people to, waiting for me. I, I, mean, I want to make sure that I, uh, I say it quickly. And those words are, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. So in that you have the call to conversion. The Greek word is metanoia, call to change our lives. So those are, okay, that's Ash Wednesday. During this time, the RCIA group, and uh, some of you are involved in that one way or another. Father Craig is the coordinator of the RCA in Spanish and English. They're preparing to receive the sacraments. So they're preparing during this special time to receive the sacraments and with their special masses and scrutinies and there's a day or two that they're, they're called to go down to the, to the cathedral uh, for a very special ceremony. So it's a time in which the catechumens, okay, there's another word for you. Okay? Catechumen, that's a big technical theological word. What does that mean? Catechumen refers to those who are preparing to become Christians, but they're not yet. So they're in process of preparation to receive the sacraments. So Lent moves on. And see these seasons, Lent and Advent, as seasons, they're, they're known as seasons of special grace. I've never been really very emotional, but almost I can feel Lent palpably. I, it's, I, I just, almost palpably I feel Lent. There's just a special grace in that time. And when I'm doing parish missions and 
preparing for general confession, there's just a special grace. You know, special grace during that, uh, that time of grace. Right, Grace? All right, then this takes us up. This takes us up to the most important week of the year. And that week is called Spanish La Semana Santa. In English, we call it Holy Week. Holy Week, a very, very important week. That's the week in which we should we should pour it on and try to live that to the to the max. You know, I'll tell people, even if you've been a sluggard, you've been lackadaisical and negligent during Lent, okay, well, you got the Holy Week, pour it on. You know, in cross-country running, sometimes you win at the last, at the last quarter mile. You can be losing, you know, you can be losing three nothing, but you hit a grand slam in the ninth inning, you still win four to three, right? <laughs> right, Robert? Yeah. So to pour it on, I mean, try not uh, try, try to live out Lent, but if you've been a, a sluggard or lackadaisical, well, you still have another opportunity to, to cash in, okay? Okay, so let's go through, Holy Week starts with uh, Palm Sunday. You're given palms. And the palms recall when our Lord mounted on a donkey, entered into the city of Jerusalem. And they were proclaiming that he was king. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they are throwing their cloaks and acclaiming him as king. The one word that comes to me is how fickle human nature is. How fickle and voluble is human nature. Be why? Because these same people that were proclaiming has, him as king, five days later will be crying out, crucify him. Many of these same people. And how easy it is for us to be on fire with the love of God, and then we don't want to get out of bed the following day. It happens. That's why I, I love the Ignatian exercise because we cannot monitor our spiritual life by our feelings. Otherwise, we're lost. We've got to plow ahead when times are tough. Now, these people, they were, hey, look at Jesus now. Jesus was keenly aware of the fact that these people are going to be crying out, let's have him crucified, let Barabbas go. What a thief. Palm Sunday also is characterized by the longest gospel reading the whole year with Good Friday. With Good Friday. Palm Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. The priest comes out in red, red because it's the, the blood of Christ. But the gospel is read of the passion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're usually standing for a good 20 minutes. That's why the, the priest will usually say people that are elderly, if you, if you really can't be standing for 20 minutes, they just sit down and you can listen to it. But it's a long gospel. But very beautiful. And it's a gospel that's read so quickly that you should be spending the whole week 
meditating upon that gospel a day at a time. Because you, we move at a quick pace. So it's the, the passion of count, account of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Passion account. Very solemn gesture is once the priest arrives at the point where Jesus expires, he dies, and people kneel down for several seconds to call to mind the suffering and death for Christ, that he suffered and he died for us. Not just for humanity, but for us. So that's Palm Sunday. Then you enter into what is called the Easter Triduum. Easter Triduum, Triduum refers to three. Three of the most holy day, days of the year. And the Easter Triduum would be Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Okay, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Okay, just a brief summary on the importance of these three days. Holy Thursday, liturgically, there is no Mass celebrated in the parishes morning or midday. The only Mass that's celebrated that day is the Mass of the, of the Last Supper, in which you have the washing of the feet. That's the only Mass that's celebrated. And we usually have one in Spanish and one in English. It's the Mass of the washing of the feet. And then at the end of the Mass, the Blessed Sacrament in this parish will be transferred from the big church to here. And there will be some time for silent adoration. Now, symbolically, it's very beautiful. Because there, during the Mass, we're, we're reliving what happened at the Last Supper when Jesus instituted the Eucharist. Okay, what did Jesus do right after instituting the Eucharist? Did he, he get up and walk? He walked along the Valley of Cedron to a place that he habitually prayed. Where did he, he go? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. So that's the whole meaning of that the little trek we have here from going to the church, walking with the Blessed Sacrament and placing the Blessed Sacrament here. And the whole purpose of that is you want to accompany Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the purpose. It's interesting that you learn that tonight because no one knows that. So Jesus is walking along the Valley of Cedron. He enters his place where he, he habitually prayed. That's why Judas was able to find, find, find Jesus. He knew that that's where Jesus prayed. And then Jesus enters, excuse me, Jesus enters into a fervent prayer such that he sweats blood. So the character of that is gratitude for the Mass as well as the priesthood. But then we want to accompany our Lord in the garden. So Holy Thursday, two fundamental ideas. The, the institution of two sacraments. The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of Holy Orders. If you don't have the latter, you don't have the former. You don't have 
the priesthood, you don't have the mass. So they're both, they're both very important, right? You people can be a thousand times more holy than we are, but you don't have our power. We as priests, we have more power than the Blessed Mother. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? Mary, of course, is much more holy, but Mary can't celebrate Mass and she can't absolve sins, but we can. Yeah, I'm a priest for many years, but sometimes it scares me that knowing the power that we have. And unless you really have faith in understanding it, we take everything for granted. That's why you, you, you should, you should on that day, you should say, happy feast day to the priest. You should. Now, none of you have probably ever done that, but you really should. Not that I'm milking that out of you, okay? <laughs> but you should. That's when I was born on Holy Thursday night in the heart of Christ. I was born. Christ was thinking about me. In the 2000, he was thinking about me that, that night and all priests. That's why Insini Jesu is such a great book that all of you should read that if you want to really appreciate the priesthood. What is it called? Insinu Jesu. None of you heard none of you have heard of that? Yes, I have. Read the blessing? I know it's all Yeah. Where? Okay. So uh, Holy Thursday. And then liturgically you go to church and the the, uh, the Blessed Sacrament is not in the tabernacle. And that, that night, we're basically entering into the Passion of Christ, that Holy Thursday night, with this. Because this, this is, this is, uh, this is the, the agony of the garden with Christ. So you're into the, you're into the full Passion of Christ now. Yes? Good point, because only, uh, only once in the gospel is Jesus seen singing. That's the only time. Not that he didn't sing. Only time it's recorded is there at the Last Supper, yeah? Well, in, in this sense, Jesus knew that how much he was going to suffer. But he knew as a result of that, many souls would be saved, including ourselves. He was aware of that, and that brought Jesus Immense joy. Immense joy. He knew, he knew exactly what was right up the road in the most minute detail. But he knew because of that, souls would be saved, and that filled him with joy. All right. So that's Holy Thursday. Good Friday. People will come to me and say that they want to go to confession because they didn't go to Mass on Good Friday. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> they, they say, I didn't go to Mass on Good Friday, so I really have to go to confession. No. What do you think? Okay, okay. There, there's no mass on Good Friday. Here's the theological question for you: Would that be a sin? Could it be a mortal sin? Because if you, if you, in your conscience, you're going against your conscience, you think that something is morally culpable. And this series, what I'll say is, uh, yeah, okay. You thought that that was a mortal sin? It's a mortal sin. And I intervene, once again, as theologian and teacher, enlightening the conscience. That there is no Mass on <coughs> Good Friday. You see, like, when, when you go against your conscience, if you have a well-formed conscience, you'll feel bad. That's a good sign. So 
someone, I didn't go to Mass on Good Friday, feeling that they're morally obliged to go to Mass on Good Friday, that's a serious sin. Even though they're not obliged even to go to the Good Friday uh, liturgy, they're not obliged. You should. See, so part of my work as a priest, spending hours in the confessional, is the formation of the conscience. And it's incumbent upon us to form our conscience as well. Most of you people have a pretty well-formed conscience, but it's not perfect. Don't kid yourself. It's not perfect. We're arriving more and more into the light, but we still have blind spots. You know, you th think about you before the exercise and after the exercise is a radical change, right? Radical change. When we're given the talk and the Ten Commandments, I didn't know that was a sin. I didn't know that was a sin. That's a sin. I didn't know that was a sin. That's a sin. I said, you, uh, did you hear that? <laughs> oh, yeah. For 16 years, we've heard that. Right, Eric? Right, Mary? Yeah. Okay, so Good Friday, you're not obliged to go to Mass because there's no Mass. But there is, there is a... Uh, there is a liturgy. So there's a, there's a Good Friday liturgy, which is very, very beautiful. Now, if you pay attention to what's going on in the liturgies, especially during Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Saturday, if you have some literary sensitivity, you're, you're blown away. If we're coarse, obtuse, dull, we in New York this year, a numbskull, nothing's going to happen, okay? Okay? If you're a numbskull, nothing's going to happen. But if you have some artistic, literary sensibility, I mean, you, you're, going to, you're, you're, you're going to ecstasy on It's so beautiful. <laughs> That's why to be, to be a Catholic, you have to try to study a little bit of, a little bit what, a, what a symbol is, no? Many of the gestures are expressed through, through, through symbols. What is a flower? You give me an hour and a half, I could write a, a, a blog on the meaning of a flower used in, in Easter. You've never heard before. You, but you have to give me a little bit of coffee, 90, <laughs> 90 minutes, a prayer of the Holy Spirit, and I will write an article, the whole purpose of why you have a flower on Easter Sunday. I'll probably write that. Yeah, I haven't written that one yet. Okay, okay? Yeah. yeah. I can write it. Not poetry, but prose. I'm a very good writer of prose, yeah. A lot depends on this, this, this moral, spiritual sensitivity, this, this spiritual mysticism of John the Cross to understand what, Beyond the physical, there's a spiritual meaning behind it. Okay? Beyond the physical, there's a spiritual meaning behind it. So in, that, in, the, in the Good Friday liturgy, what do you have? The priest comes out in red, and that can be divided, that can be divided into three different parts. What are they? You have the liturgy of the word. So you've got the reading. And once again, you have the reading of the Passion of Christ, but it's going to be different from Sunday. So Sunday, upon Sunday, you have a reading of the Passion, but on Good Friday, it's going to be different. See, what people say the church... It's always the same thing. What a lot of baloney that is. There's a lot of variety. A lot. If you go through the Masses, there's tons of variety. For example, I, the preface you have before the Holy, 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 if you go through the sacramentary, there's tons of prefaces. And they're very beautiful. When I was in a seminary, my formator said, Pray using the Word of God and using the liturgy. 
you pull out the sacramentary that I'm using as a priest, that'll, that'll, that'll blow you away. Those prayers are so beautiful. The sacramentary is, is the book that we use on the altar. Okay? The lectionary is, what is from the, the readings. Now that could be part of your holy hour, you know, talk with your spiritual director. If you do a holy hour on, uh, the holy hour you can do on, on a Eucharistic prayer. Or the preface. Okay, the second part of the liturgy of Good Friday would be that of the Eucharist. You don't have a Mass, but you do have the Eucharist in which once again, the altar is prepared. The priest goes into the sacristy to get the consecrated hosts. And then we introduce it with the Our Father, and people can receive Holy Communion on Good Friday. People can receive Communion on, on Good Friday. Okay, the last part. This will drive the Jehovah Witnesses and the Protestants berserk. <laughs> They'll go crazy. You know why? You ready? <laughs> the adoration of the Holy Cross. Oh, no. Uh, if, they, if they were to come in and see that, those Catholics, they are idolaters. <laughs> yeah. And I would say, well, do you have, a, you have a mom where? In Mexico. Do you have pictures of her? Yeah, uh, idolatry. <laughs> you ever kiss the picture? I, yeah, I actually do on her birthday, yeah. Yeah, my, my dad passed away, yeah. Wow, talk about idolatry. <laughs> you just hit a grand slam there, I tell you. You know, we're not, we have to, we have to encounter God through images. You know, we're, we're body and soul. And then Thomas Aquinas, using Aristotle, speaks very clearly. Sense perception comes through what we see, what we touch. The sacraments are sensible. Bread and wine, water, oil, right? So what's done, and, and, and honestly, the cultures we have here, the, the Filipino culture formed by the Hispanics, as well as the Hispanics, they love that. Right? Be able to come up, and, come up in front of the cross and make a genuflection and kiss the cross. They love it. I love it, too. Because what is that? By, by making a genuflection and kissing the cross, what are you doing? You're showing the fact that you're, you adore Christ and you love him because he suffered so much for you. Now, what I've just said is almost common sense, but you never really thought about that before. Unless we reflect, these spiritual truths are never going to hit, hit home. So that's Good Friday. That's Good Friday. All right. Um, I move at a pretty so, slow pace. We haven't gotten through the church year. But I have to make a couple of announcements now because it's already way beyond the hour. I try to keep it within an hour. Is We're, we're going to have a two-week break. Okay? Because we're... we're, we're, we're right before Christmas. However, I, I have to say this, that because of the fact that there's really not too many, I may have to cancel it. Okay? So I have to discern. I have to discern. I'm praying over it. I'm, t I'm talking it out with you know, Father Larry and with other people. Um, I, I, I was expecting, because of the promotion, that we'd have the big church full, and we got just a very s small handful of people, no? So I have to discern that. And it's, 
kind of tough because I've been, I've been preparing this for six months. I've already written 35 articles, English and Spanish. I'm really well prepared. But if the people don't want it, I'm, I, I can't force. I think it's a good topic. Do you like the topic? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, your people are here. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of surprised because I just finished, with the help of Elvira and Mary and, and other people, I finished a popular mission outside the parish in, um, in Linwood, St. Philip Mary, and we had the closing mass was packed to the gills, and we had 340? We had about 340 people persevering in another parish and here we are at St. Peter Chanel, and we have, you know. So I, I, have to ch I have to discern if, after these two weeks, you can bring someone, okay, you can bring someone, we're going to have this church full, then I'll consider uh, continuing. But I have to, because this is huge, I, I was planning on doing it for a whole year. So for me, as a priest, that's, that's a a huge block of time, uh, and I'm doing it in Spanish too. The, the, the Spanish w response was even worse than English. I was shocked, yeah, because we really promoted it. So we're, if the people don't want it, I can't force it. But as I said, the first class, the reason why people are not coming to church because they don't understand the mass. That's what I said in my first class. So uh, we'll, we'll see in two weeks, and I have to discern. I have to discern. Just within the past 10 days, I've had uh, two invitations to go to two other parishes to give missions, so I'm thinking, well, <laughs> the idea would be do it right here in the parish, but if the people in the parish here, they don't want my services, I'll go somewhere else. No? It's, it's, uh, it's ironic, no? I would have other groups. Uh, I would have sometimes groups as many as a thousand people. We're not even a hundred here. Yeah, yeah I, uh, when I was at the peak, we'd have a thousand people. We, we, we could get in here. I don't know if a thousand, but hundreds upon hundreds, at least, at least five, six hundred. No? And it could be because of the pandemic, and I'm not interpreting the situation. However, if in Linwood you got three to four hundred people showing up, in a Compton poor area, it's kind of a poor, kind of scary area that is, yeah. and the people are going there, and they're just uh, they're they're just eating up everything we're doing. And it was it was a consecration of Saint Joseph, and I've never done that before, no. So uh, basically, it's the ball is in your court. I mean, if if all of you can bring maybe two or three people after the Christmas break, I'll consider it. Another possibility might be I might just go back to a half hour uh, on, on Friday, maybe that a half hour in English and a half hour so that will give me another day to maybe go out and do missions. Because what I'm thinking about is, I mean, I love you people, and, and it's great to have you, and I love giving the talk to you. But I'm thinking, uh, I, I'm thinking of saving souls. In another place, you've got 500 people waiting for me, then I think that that's God's will rather than staying here. I would love it that you just respond to what we have here and fill the churches, but there's, there's a certain indifference and, and deadness here. You know? I feel it, no? So, uh, sorry to leave you on that sour note, but I just have to be honest with you. And I've been... Well, I'm, I, I, I may even go to St. Philip Mary. Right over here. I'm more, we're thinking maybe going to other places because if they don't want it here. <laughs> because it, it's so ironic. This by far is the best place. We got, we got the best places to teach in the world. You got the Blessed Sacrament there. You can go to Mass right before. We got the photocopy machine. We can turn on the heater. <laughs> I mean, what more do you want, you want me to... I can put myself and try to spit out wooden nickels, but there's only so much, so much, so much we can do. No. Yeah, I mean, I, it, w w the first couple of days, I was really, I was in desolation. Yeah, 
Because I've been preparing this for six months, and look, barely anyone shows up. No? Which is a rarity. Usually when they have these, these activities, usually almost 90% of the time, people respond really well. Probably it might be because of Krishna's experience. <laughs> okay, it might be that. Okay, it, it might be that, yeah. So what I'm going to do is we'll have two weeks vacation, we'll come back New Year, and then I, I might try it for, for the month of January, but I have to, I have to discern. And I, I just feel that, you know, that the, the time in the presence of the priesthood, I think, is important. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I know that the priesthood's got a lot of the power. I want to use it where I can save more souls, if I can be blunt with you, you know. And I go to another place, there's 500 people waiting for me, or 300, 400 people waiting for me, that have maybe never heard, heard these messages preached. Uh, I... This is where Ignatian discernment, I've talked it out with a couple of friends, I've talked it out with Father Larry, my spiritual director is on vacation, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough discernment that I have to make. Hmm? So, yeah. I think because uh, a lot of people are also watching it online. People watching it online. Okay. Okay, well, well, we'll take that into account also. Yeah. What? The gas went out. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Ah, drive to Linwood, no? I'll have to ask my mother from Vero Beach to send me a couple of bucks so I can travel to Linwood, okay? Well, we can offer galaxies and come get access. Ah. Just to make you happy, I drove an hour and 45 minutes for this class. What? From where? Newport. Newport? I left work at 5.30. Well, well, thank you. It, no, it, 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 you people are great, but also I said to Father Larry, you know, it's like preaching to the choir. I mean, you know what that means? Right. He said, you people are well-formed. We have to get some people that are not well-formed. You people are probably among the best well-formed people in the parish, and it's great forming you, but you've heard me preaching. Bring someone back to the church. I've been preaching that the past six months. Bring someone back. Bring them back. You know, pray for the grace. Bring someone back. I mean, there's millions of souls out there. Pray for the grace to bring them back. Would you consider maybe possibly doing them in longer, like monthly instead of weekly? And it would help with your time. Okay. So maybe, maybe, maybe like once a month? That might be a possibility. Or, or, or it could be, or, or it could be like give a half hour in English, a half hour in Spanish. But the way I am, it takes me a while to develop a theme. Just usually, I, I like a good hour to develop my theme. Yes. Are you going to do the same um, classes, in, for example, wherever you go, or are you just following? Great question. What, what I'm, what I'm doing now is, um, I, I've been on mission about. For, for about six years before the pandemic, Elvira? 2014. Oh, 2014, and we knock out two years, so, well, close to a good seven years. And what we've done is uh, the Marian consecration. Mm -hmm. We've done that for many years, mostly in Spanish, right? in English too. Then my book came out in 2017. Then I've done also the spiritual exercises in um, Spanish and English. The best that's, uh, that's ever been done was in, Yor in Yorba Linda in St. Martin of Pours. That was, I was expecting a very bad response but we ended up with, what, 400 people? 
400 plus people persevering for 10 weeks. We had so many general confessions that we had to ship them in from Texas, these priests, to hear confession. And I was thinking, ah, this upper middle class Anglo society where I come from, they're not going to respond. But they responded. <laughs> I was thinking, that area, a little bit lower than Beverly Hills, oh, you forget it. But no, they, <laughs> they, they really responded well. I think it's related to Father C in the adoration. I think once you have a parish that's, that's practicing, practicing Eucharistic adoration around the clock, then a lot of graces flow from that. Yeah. I came from another parish. I just happened to What's that? I came from another parish. Yes. I, I just happened to come that one Sunday when you announced it. And perhaps we should open it up to our parishes to be uh, benefited so much. It's like, like the gentleman said, I, if we do it somewhere else, then we'll follow you there. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, well, we'll think about it, no? Can yes. Yeah. In my style as a teacher, catechist, uh, I always have a lot to say, and I find that half hour. Yeah, that's true. Most of my talks I give, even online, are a good hour. Yeah. Well, well, th- uh, thank you for your feedback. Pray for me because I I have to discern. I I. I, I I want to be with you people, but I want to do God's will. Yes. And if God wants me to be maybe some other place, where more so for me it's always the Majis, how can I save more souls? And I'm just keenly aware of the fact that I'm not getting any younger. You aren't either, are you? No. <laughs> you know, I've arrived at, in, in my life, I've lived a good probably a good 75, 80% of my life. Oh, I, mean, I could die tomorrow. No? And I'm keenly, I'm keenly aware of time. And, and I, I just don't want to waste time. I want to use my time to the max for the purpose of trying to bring as many souls to God as possible. Uh, so... Yeah, that's right. We had, at the peak, Father Larry actually said he actually had to turn some people away at the peak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as Eric and Mary and your spiritual director say, in desolation, you got to fight against it, and you got to you have to do the agia de contra, no? I know you're trained in that, but but it's true. If they're not trained, they give into it, and then the desolation becomes more dense. Sad to say. Well, Father Ed, I know that your first sermon was Friday night. Yes. Well, see, I know some people can't come because they work early the next day. Okay. And Thursday night is different from Friday night, where people are up for the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I have to I have to open up to the Hispanics too. So that, that's the Friday night. I have to be fair to them because there's a lot of Hispanics too. And sad to say that's as we're pointing out, the, the Hispanics are the ones that are, are drifting more and more away from the church more than anyone else. And that kind of worries me. The Hispanics are the ones that are walking away from the church. So if you are a Hispanic, let's pray that we can try to get, bring them back. I don't really understand that why. We have a lot of Hispanics here. I, 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 maybe I'm naive. I would have thought during the pandemic that more people would come to church. But we only have about 60% of the people that come to church, so we've lost 40%. And that also means the fact, if I can be honest with you, in a couple of years this is going to be the case. We're not gonna, we won't have enough money for, to keep the church going. In a couple of years. Because we... We're a poor parish. We don't have money. And we try to help out the poor. 
but you know, we have to have money to pay the bills, and we've got we got workers that have five, six kids, and um, during Christmas, during Christmas, very often people will give me money, just give it to the workers with their five or six kids. All the money that comes to me, I give it to Father Larry, and we see who are the poor people we can have, we can help out. We don't take the money to go to Las Vegas or this casino. <laughs> no, you give it to the poor. Yeah. But let, let, let me tell you this. One of the best ways to overcome, there was a uh, very famous, I think it was Maslow, very famous psychologist who lived a 100 years ago. And Fulton Sheen used this in one of his talks. What do you do for someone that's suicidal or depressed? Not so much taking pills, even though you might have to take that, Get them out to serve others, to get out of yourself. And that's my point. You know, if you're really feeling sad about yourself, instead of throwing a pity party, go and help someone. And when you, when you end up by helping someone, you, for, you forget that you are depressed. <coughs> so that's the Aja de Conte. You want to stay in bed and have a, a pity party and just you know, throw your pity party. Get out there and help someone that's poorer than you. We have more than 99% of the people in the world. We don't. We have more than 99% of the people. We have more than them. So why, why should we bemoan our, our bad luck, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep, let's keep praying, going to Mass, offer our rosary, offer our penances. Because I, I just feel one of my missions, I don't feel like I'm, I'm doing too much, is trying to bring as much people back to the church as possible. Uh, I, I feel that that's part of my mission, try to bring as many people. And people like you who are well-formed, you're, you're probably the ones that could do it best. You're probably the ones that can do it best because you, you've experienced the love of God. You, 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 you receive the Eucharist. You can't live without daily Mass. Many of you go to daily Mass, right? You can't live without the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the very heart and center of your life. You want to you wanna communicate that fire to other people. Well, good. Okay, so... Thank you, and uh, I'll give you my priestly blessing. And thank you for your sharing. It was very, very, very good. And then we'll see you. And Mary, going to give out a, a sheet. Can just hand out okay. So Mary's going to give you a, just a handout. So you know, it'll it'll be in two weeks, right? Yes. Okay. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour. The Lord be with you. And may God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.